So once again, we're looking at a diagram of the human brain, the outer covering called the cerebral cortex. You know that the frontal lobe is at the front of the brain. It's located in front of the central fissure, and it's responsible for planning and movement. And I've drawn some little red X's in the frontal lobe, representing the movement part of the frontal lobe's responsibilities. But we're going to come back to that in a moment. First, I want to introduce you to the other lobes of the human brain. Behind the central fissure, you see the parietal lobe. Now, that's a word that students mispronounce frequently. Try saying it. Parietal. The parietal lobe. This lobe of the brain is responsible for somatosensory and spatial perception. So, look at the first four letters of somatosensory. It's soma. And you remember that the soma is the cell body of a neuron. So, that will help you remember the functions of the parietal lobe. Somatosensory. Bodily sensations as well as spatial perception, where your body is in space. Are you standing or sitting right side up, or are you upside down? Are you leaning to the left or leaning to the right? Is your body being touched? Where is it being touched? Are you being touched on your left hand or your right hand? These are the functions of the parietal lobe. Now, something interesting about the parietal lobe is that when there's severe damage to the right parietal lobe, then an individual is likely to exhibit something called left side neglect meaning they neglect the left side of their body. If they wake up in the morning and start getting dressed, they'll put their right arm in the right sleeve of a shirt and forget to put the left arm in the left sleeve or the right leg into the right pants leg, but not the left. If you ask someone with left side neglect to stand facing forward and describe everything they see in front of them, they will neglect everything in their left visual field describing what they see in the right visual field. Then you ask them to turn slightly to the left so that everything that they missed from the left visual field is now in their right visual field and they'll be able to describe it. But now they'll miss everything that's now in their left visual field. At the very back of the brain is the occipital lobe and this is responsible for vision. In fact, there are parts of the visual cortex where the entire visual field is mapped out. And I wouldn't do it because it's invasive, but I could place a microelectrode into a portion of the visual cortex. If I were to electrically stimulate it, and now you know I can also chemically stimulate that neural tissue using a substance that mimics a neurotransmitter. But if I go in and I were to stimulate a portion of the visual cortex, then an individual is likely to report that they see lights in the corresponding part of the visual field. I could also place microelectrodes to measure the activity of single neuron in the visual cortex and then present lights or images at various parts of the visual field and if I move them around I'll eventually find the location of the visual field that is associated with the activity of that one neuron whose behavior we're recording. There are also parts of the occipital lobe that receive information about lights or events in one's visual field and they process that information, integrate it at higher and higher levels. Last but not least, we have the temporal lobe of the cerebral cortex. This is located below the lateral fissure on each side of the head. And the temporal lobe is responsible for audition, which is hearing, and memory. So I could go in, albeit it's invasive, but I could go in with microelectrode, stimulate a part of the auditory cortex, and that individual would say that they heard a sound. We also know that the temporal lobe is involved in memory. Damage to this portion of the temporal lobe can affect memory processing. Now we're going to talk about memory in much more detail later in the semester. It's, it has a topic all to itself later on. But I can mention this. There are reports, anecdotal reports, which are not necessarily strong evidence of any type of phenomenon, but there are anecdotal reports about people during surgery having these portions related to memory of the temporal lobe stimulated and suddenly recalling a long lost memory, maybe of a, a fifth birthday party. But there's no way to go back and determine whether or not the memory is accurate, whether or not the suddenly remembered events are accurately recalled. And so you need to take that with a grain of salt and be very skeptical about it. But there is a great deal of evidence that the temporal lobe has portions that are responsible for memory processing. Personally, I find the temporal lobe absolutely fascinating. You don't need to know all this, but 
it's an illustration of some of the procedures for studying the brain that we'll talk about later. When I first came to URI, which was many years ago, there was a study published in Science, the journal Science, probably the most prestigious journal in the world. Apparently, researchers had placed microelectrodes in the temporal lobe of sheep, and then they presented these sheep with pictures of other sheep. And it turns out that these researchers had discovered cells in the temporal lobe of sheep brains that changed their firing rates for images of familiar sheep, but not for unfamiliar sheep. So basically, these cells were responding to photographic images of sheep that the sheep whose brain it was <laughs> had met out in the pasture, but that those cells did not respond to pictures of unfamiliar sheep or sheep that particular sheep had never met. Other researchers have worked with monkeys and shown that there are cells in the infral temporal lobe, which is really just inside that lateral fissure, inside that fold, that change their firing rate when the monkey is shown pictures of monkey hands. Some of them seem to change their firing rate for images of monkey hands where the palm is being presented. Other cells seem to respond when it's the back of the hand being presented, and so on. These are examples of single cell recording, and it has been very useful in the study of the functioning of the human brain. But we need to be careful, because when you're doing single cell recording and presenting, say, a picture of a familiar sheep or a monkey's hand to an animal, it is impossible to show pictures of everything else in the world. So you don't know if there are other images that could cause that cell to react or to respond with a change in firing rate. So although these studies are useful for understanding the brain and its functions, we do need to be careful in how we interpret the results. I said that we were going to come back and talk about the motor cortex, and now is the time. Right in front of the central fissure, and I've marked it with some red X's, you have the motor cortex in the frontal lobe. And the motor cortex is responsible for our body's movements. People who are undergoing brain surgery may very well be conscious for a portion of the procedure so that the surgeon can electrically or chemically stimulate brain tissue at different locations in order to map out the brain and make sure that that surgery is not going to affect important brain tissue unless it's necessary. There are no pain receptors in the brain, so this is not a particularly painful process for an individual undergoing surgery. Here's what happens when the motor cortex is stimulated during a surgical procedure. If a microelectrode is placed into, a, say, a part of the motor cortex and that neural tissue is electrically or chemically stimulated, the person may move the pinky finger. Then if the electrode is removed and it's placed in a nearby area and that area of the motor cortex is electrically or chemically stimulated, then the person may move her or his hand and so on. And in fact, the entire human body is mapped out on the motor cortex. I'll show you a diagram of this map in just a moment. But first I want you to look at the blue X's that I put right behind the central fissure inside the parietal lobe. Remember the parietal lobe is responsible for somatosensory and spatial perception. The entire human body is mapped out on the somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe as well. Now when a person is undergoing brain surgery and a portion of the somatosensory cortex is stimulated, you won't see movement. You won't see a body part moving. What will happen is that that individual will say, my hand itches. And then if the microelectrode is pulled out and moved to a slightly different portion of the somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe, then they may say, my shoulder is itchy. I feel a tingle on my shoulder. You should know that the motor cortex is located in the frontal lobe in front of the central fissure while the somatosensory cortex is located behind the central fissure in the parietal lobe. And now I want to show you maps of these portions of the human brain.